Hello, Hope. Uh, this is actually Anchor Day. So if you're watching a recorded sermon because you couldn't join us, understand. But this is just going to feel a little different because Anchor Day just has to be with bouncy houses and a pig and a bluegrass band and all that stuff. It's a different energy, but I'll do my best to convey that um, on a recording. Um, so here's a question. How many of you listening uh, have come to Hope within the last two years? And then... How many of you were here kind of in the first years? And I want to ask that at Anchor Day. I'm just really interested of people who've been here all seven years and people who've come in the last couple of years, because we've had a bunch come in the last couple of years. Um, but those at the beginning, by the way, you're called charter members, you know, so in like traditional churches that one day you charter members, we're going to walk you forward with walkers and things like that. And someone's going to have to carry up front. And we're going to celebrate the original, the charter members. And then you're going to go to K&W cafeteria afterward to eat soft food. Uh, with the young people in the church who are going to carry you over there. But I've been thinking about this whole idea of like anniversaries. When people have anniversaries, work anniversaries, all that kind of stuff, it's just kind of funny because it's like if it's a marriage, you know, a marriage people are, you know, been married 40 years and you still married? Yeah, she hadn't, you know, kicked me out yet. And work anniversaries, yeah, they haven't fired me yet, still alive, you know, escape death one more year, just kind of things like that. Like, what do we do at anniversaries? We feel like we're supposed to do things, but what's the purpose of one? Uh, Anchor Day really is, the more I think about it, it's not an anniversary in that way. It's not really even a birthday party. Yes, it marks the seven years of when we officially started the church, but it's not like, oh, we've escaped, you know, death for seven years. We haven't had to close the doors and people keep coming and Anchor Day is more than that. To me, this is what it is. It's a reminder of what God has called us to and what I believe God is still calling us to seven years later. Um, today, to me, is more of a renewal of a commitment that we have to God and to each other uh, than it is kind of an anniversary. Um, it's a celebration, but it's a celebration of the goodness of God, uh, not anything that we've done. Make sense? So don't remember, I know we use the word birthday and anniversary, but really it's a celebration of the goodness of God. It's not about what we've done. So I want to pray for us and we're going to look at Hebrews 6 today. God, go before us. The world does not need more Nate Stratman. We need more of you, Lord Jesus, your powerful spirit, God, guiding us, convicting us, showing us, encouraging us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Hebrews 6, there's this powerful section uh, starting at verse 13 where it talks about a promise of God, God's promises. And I need to do a whole series on the promises of God. I've realized I, I don't feel like I've taught a whole bunch on that recently. But in this section is the founding verse for our church, the verse that from the very get-go, it shaped our logo, it shaped, it is the scripture, it shaped the name of our church. And I'm going to share it with you. Verse uh, 13, and I'm going to use the message translation on this one because I love it. When God made his promise, we're talking about the promises of God. When he made his promise to Abraham, he backed it all the way, putting his own reputation on the line. He said, I promise that I'll bless you with everything I have. Bless and bless and bless. Abraham stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. When people make promises, they guarantee them by appeal to some authority above them so that if there is any question that they'll make good on the promise, the authority will back them up. When God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word, a rock solid guarantee. God can't break his word. And because his word cannot change, the promises the promise is likewise unchangeable. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope. I love that phrase. It's a promised hope. We grab that promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. Talking about the hope. Reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus running on ahead of us, has taken up his permanent post as high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. 
Okay, that verse 19 is actually where we, it's kind of our guiding verse for our church. It says this in the, in the message. We grab that promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. The NIV is what you might be more familiar with. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So what is the logo of hope, our church? Uh, it's, it's an anchor. So, the hope that we have in God through Christ is a promised hope. This is a promise. God does not break his promises, right? He keeps his promises. You will have hope, people of God. So this is why it makes sense to me that this anchor, it's like a cross anchor, uh, was an early, like a popular early Christian symbol that was used in the time of persecution, right? The people would see the hope of salvation that comes in the cross, but also see the anchor, meaning that, that we are anchored in and through Jesus, that we have hope because of that anchoring, even in the midst of the storm that's pulling the boat all over the places, that through Christ we are anchored, right? Which gives us hope. So if that symbol worked for them in the early church, it works for us. We're going to stick with it. We're going to keep our name, Hope Community. So that's my declaration on the seventh year of our church. But I was reflecting back. I do it all the time, thinking back uh, every time that we celebrate Anchor Day every year. And I keep asking myself, what was I thinking? And not in the sense of like, what were you thinking, man? But like, what was I thinking in those early days? Now, the Risleys had been praying and some other folks, my family, people with us in Colorado. But I'm thinking about just myself. Like, what was I thinking? seven years ago before we came out here. What was the why for planting hope? And the why always matters. What was the why? Um, I remember we had this interview with another church. We flew from Colorado and interviewed with this other church that happened to be in the Lake Norman area. And at the very end of it, Kim said something that just, it was like, pew. But as we were talking with them, she basically said, you could do this, kind of like that just about that tone. You could do this. And I was like, it just felt weird. Like, you could probably do an okay job. And, you know, you know, you've seen churches like this with old people, young people, contemporary worship versus traditional and arguing and yeah, blah, blah, blah. you've seen that. You could do it. But I just believe God had something better. I didn't know exactly what it was. Some conversations were bubbling up, but God had something better. And there are two driving forces, and this is what I want to share today. There are two driving forces in me that I really believe that the Holy Spirit was stirring up. And it wasn't just me. It was, I believe that the Spirit was stirring this up in a bunch of other people, but I'm just speaking for me today. And the first one is burden. Now think about that. I actually think God can give us a burden. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I do assessment for all the people who want to plant churches all over the country and really the world within our denomination, our movement. And so I spend hours and hours and hours assessing po folks to see if they're a good fit to plant a church. And I listen for something. I don't tell them, but I listen for something. And I always listen for burden. Is there a burden that God had placed on your heart? Is it a, a people group? Is it a part of town? Is it an issue? I don't know what it is, but there's all these people have burdens. Just the other week, it was this young couple from uh, Egypt who lives in Virginia, and there's a town with a lot of uh, immigrants, uh, Arabic-speaking immigrants, and, and they have a heart for these people, very specific. I could hear their burden. They know what it's like to come to this country and navigate all those things. The burden was was thick. But my burden was actually disconnected and scattered sheep. We had done youth ministry here for many years, and I just knew a lot of the people that I used to know were not really connected with churches anymore. Some were, but a lot weren't. Um, these were kids who had a life-changing run-in with the living God. I know it. I saw it. Mission trips and camps and conversations at Flame and Amy's. And for one reason or another, these people, these kids had wandered away. They aren't kids anymore. They were in their 20s and 30s when we got here. I still have that same burden. Um, the statistics, when you think about the church in America, they're not good. Uh, when you read the Barna Institute, they do a lot of good work. They actually have said, we have entered the point of irreversible decline, talking about the church in America. 
And every time you hear a stat about people fleeing the faith or any of those types of things, please know that all those stats have names. Like I could tell you if it wasn't for privacy, I could tell you names, lots of names. You could too, of people who have deconstructed, right? It's personal to me. Um, my heart is burdened when I think about those who don't know Christ. Um, when I think about those who have deconstructed their faith. I know for a fact many see a church that does not look so much like Jesus. They see the moral failures. It's all over Twitter and all the uh, social media and the news. They see the abuses of power. They see the worship attainment that has been attempted, all the stuff. And as I've been thinking about that, I, I was remembering this statement that a Senate chaplain said, a guy named uh, Dick Halverson. He said, listen to this. In the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women centered on the living Christ. Then the church moved to Greece, where it became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome, where it became an institution. Next, it moved to Europe, where it became a culture or a Christendom. And finally, it moved to America, where it became an enterprise or a business. I see that drift. I see the faces. I hear the stories. I know there's a lack of hope with some. It burdens me. I know it burdens many of you. It burdens Jesus. But don't forget this. The burdens, many burdens often for believers come from God. And those burdens can move us to deeper love more Christ-like love. Now, the other driving force, not just burden, but the other one was hope. Seven years ago, there was burden and there was hope. And hope is not this wish or a dream, like a hope it doesn't rain Sunday for church or something like that. Hope is holy confidence, even amidst the chaos and the uncertainty, but it's holy confidence that God is faithful, right? That is hope. It's, it's that you have confidence that God is who he says he is and he's gonna do what he says he's gonna do. That is hope. And so think about what can you do with hope? Well, with hope, you actually stick your neck out a little more. Um, so for us driving across the country, just for our family thinking, are we gonna have a salary for a long term? Who's gonna show up besides just my family and the Risleys? You know, you can actually stick your neck out because it's hope that's driving you. Um, in a funeral, I can say with confidence, and I see it, that Christians say that death is not the end. Paul says that, right? It's a, it's a comma and not a period. We have hope even in the saddest of situations. We lift our heads up in a funeral. We can because of Christ. Hope keeps us from giving up on people, especially those who have walked away from the faith don't give up, right? When I think about these kids I know who are no longer following Jesus, I think about the hound of heaven. It's that phrase that comes from an English poet in the 1890s. And he, and he titled this poem, The Hound of Heaven. And, and the poem apart says this, and he's talking about God. As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing near in the chase, with unhurrying and unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. As the hound follows the rabbit, the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing near in the chase, with unhurrying and unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. It's the relentless pursuit of God for his kids, no matter how far off they are. That should fill your soul with hope. That gives me great hope. I don't give up on people. I go, man, I have, I have hope in a God that's bigger than the situation. So burdens and hope are these incredible driving forces that Christians have that allow us, I think, to love as Jesus loved. I think Jesus had burdens and hope. That's why he wept over Jerusalem. But he saw something bigger. He saw something greater. Right? These are motivators that helped us start the church seven years ago. And my hope, my prayer is that God would continue to place burdens on our heart and always place the hope of Jesus before us for the next 70 years, 70 times seven, 777. 
So think about this. Pause for a second. What burdens has God placed on you in this season, on us? What are the burdens we might have? Is it poverty? Is it those that don't know Jesus? Is it those with addiction? Is it, what, what might it be? But it is the promised hope of Christ that Hebrews 6 talks about that will guide us as we respond to the burdens that God places uh, on our heart. So what does hope look like for the next seven years? As I, part of this is vision. Where are we going? And it's so much more than will we have a building or not or hire more people or programs. It's so much better than that and richer than that. So I want to give you an image. Uh, Philip Yancey, an author, he said, all too often the church holds up a mirror reflecting back, right, the society that's around it instead of or rather than a window revealing a different way. I'm going to say that again, and I don't have a window with me right now, but you all know what a window looks like. That's kind of a window behind me. Anyways, Yancey says this, all too often the church holds up a mirror reflecting back the society around it rather than a window revealing a different way. Ponder that. If we're honest, Christians don't often look that much different than our non-Christian friends. But we don't want to be a mirror church just reflecting back everything that's around us. That's not what Christ called us to do. We want to be a window, right? A different way. We want to have, like, if you think about this, if you, if we have a true burden for our neighbors in need, a true burden for those that don't know the living Jesus, the grace and mercy and kindness of the living Jesus, right? If we have an anchored hope in Christ, and our anchored hope is in nothing else, right? We don't put it in our careers or anything else. That will result in us being window Christians and not mirror Christians. It will result in us being window Christians who are showing a different way to be human. And because of hope, others will see that different way. A glimpse of heaven on earth. It's a great image. Now, I sent this text, I'm going to close on this, but I sent this text randomly last night to just a bunch of people in the church, just who I had your numbers and I just, I don't know, a handful of people. And I just said, because of hope, fill in the blank and not hope our church, hope of Jesus. But what would you say? Like, what is the difference that hope makes for you right today? And I just got some great responses. This isn't all of them, but it's some of them. Because of hope, our burdens are not eternal and hope can actually turn our burdens into blessings. Because of hope, I'm able to fall asleep peacefully without fear of what is coming tomorrow. Because of hope, a struggling marriage, a wayward child, a fractured family are not beyond repair. Because of hope, I can handle a Trump-Biden rematch. <laughs> I laughed at that, but I think like, hope is bigger than politics. Because of hope, I don't need life to go according to my plan all the time. Because of hope, seasons of fear are just seasons. And by the way, a teenager said that. Because of hope, we love the poor, the widow, the orphan, the addict, the lonely with expectation. Because of hope, I can rest in uncertainty and find peace in darkness. Because of hope, I'm free from the enslavement of proving I'm worthy. I'm free from needing to please or control other people. I'm free from worry and fear. I'm free from saving myself or trying to save anybody else. All that because of hope. Because of hope, the fear of fill in the blank, the person said, that fear doesn't have any place in the hope of Christ. Because of hope, my whole life is transformed, but not just mine, but for my family for generations and generations. Because I hope we can triumph over the unbearable. The mundane has meaning and sacrificial love is common. I want to read that one again. Because of hope, we can triumph over the unbearable. The mundane has meaning and sacrificial love is common. Because of hope, I made a little more into who I was created to be each day. Because of hope, I'm assured that I am loved and that my life has purpose and meaning. So then I'm freed to, ha to having, I am freed from having to create purpose and meaning for myself all by myself. 
Because of hope, I have life-shaping certainty. Because of hope, Jesus' redemption is bigger than any of my failures. And last one. Because of hope, I know my longest, darkest days will pass and things will be better again. I can keep going. I'm here because of hope. You're here because of hope. This church will remain because of hope. This church is here because of hope. So Hebrews 6.19, may we grab the promised hope with both hands, never letting go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Let's pray. In you, Jesus, God, we have our anchor Lord, there are so many waves and things pushing us to drift away, but the line is tight, that you are the anchor, God, that keeps us centered, that keeps us safe, that keeps us confident in the midst of the chaos that we see, the cultural chaos, so we don't drift in you, Lord Jesus. And God, this is a promise. It's not a suggestion. It's not just some encouraging thought. You've made this promise that we have hope because of you in and through Jesus. And God, we also believe that we have the power and confidence to face the burdens that many of you've placed on our hearts. And we we face them with hope, knowing that this is not all there is. This is not the end of the story, that God, you're at work even as we sleep. And we're grateful for that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. See you next week.